Tú, tú dices una mujer... No, no, yo le dije todo eso a otra Daniela. Bueno, no sé. cuando yo hablo, tú cállate la boca. Tú entiendes. In our last YouTube video, I asked Daniela a history question on Cameo because she was a history professor for 19 years. My thought process was it would be a fun activity for our channel. Why don't we play a flashback right now of the question that I asked her? Flashback. During the Cold War, there was a widespread belief developed that the United States was losing the war of ideas to the Soviet Union supposedly superior propaganda. How did the United States respond and what kind of visual stories did they tell? And here, my wet saw children, is Daniel's response to our question. So this very much looks like a New York State U.S. History Regions question. So I googled the exact statement and found the exact statement on AmericanForeignRelations.com, which is where I am right now. And so the response is, as Cold War tensions intensified, the United States gradually expanded its propaganda capabilities. In 1948, the information program received permanent legislative sanction with the passage of the Smith-Munn Act, the first legislative charter for a peacetime propaganda program. The act gave the State Department jurisdiction over both international information operations and cultural and educational exchange programs. Now, I'm not going to read the whole page to you, even though I feel like you asked for this because you just love to hear me speak, which is awesome. But um, if you want any other history questions, I suggest sticking to race relations and social movements in the United States. That's where my area of expertise is, like American... American identity, American immigration, those are my, those are my jam. But thank you for this question. It was pretty awesome to do this research. <laughs> You do realize, Danielle, that if this was a history project, it would be graded as a fail because you didn't answer the second part of my question. How did the United States respond and what kind of visual stories did they tell? While you were at it, you should have just typed in visual propaganda Cold War. Look at all these visuals. Each poster tells a different story. You don't have to be a historian to be aware that the Cold War was not characterized by direct armed conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States. The Soviet Union and the United States never fought each other directly. However, both sides did wage a war of words with each other through a series of propaganda campaigns with the intention being to undermine the other side. Visuals, very important part of the question that I asked. I'm, I'm not gonna harp on it too much. During the Cold War, films were certainly important. However, one propaganda medium that we are all likely very familiar with are posters. Ladies and gentlemen, a plethora of iconic posters were created during the Cold War era. When I asked Danielle, the subpar history professor, about the Soviet Union's supposedly superior propaganda, what was I referring to? This poster right here was produced by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The title at the top reads curse the butchers while the title at the bottom reads american instigators of war are the enemies of humanity let's ask ourselves class what kind of message is the soviet union trying to convey to its citizens that you should be scared of american military you should be scared of the brutality that they display it has no room in our modern world. Now that we got that out of the way, let's get to the second part of the question that Danielle missed because she was too busy making $44 in one minute with minimal effort. How did the United States respond and what kind of visual stories did they tell? Is this tomorrow America under communism? During the time period of the Cold War, Red Scare propaganda had real effects on the lives of citizens of the United States. Being called a communist back then, those were fighting words. I chose this poster in particular to highlight because the United States government did a very good job of explaining to citizens that communists come in all different shapes and sizes. The fear mongering. Your neighbor could be a communist and if you suspect that your neighbor is a communist you should report it to the authorities because those dirty commies are trying to undermine our capitalist society that America is built on and we need to get them out of here. During this time a lot of citizens were scared shitless and it was like that Spider-Man meme where no one trusted anybody. What a lot of people don't realize is the emotional panic that accompanies fear shuts down the prefrontal cortex or the rational thinking part of our brains. In other words when we're consumed by fear we stop thinking and a populace that stops thinking for themselves is easily led, easily manipulated, and easily controlled. Both the United States and the Soviet Union use propaganda posters as visuals to control their citizens through fear. And that right there would have been a satisfactory answer to my question. From the lack of effort that Danielle put into this cameo for our community, it's easy to see why she's over $200,000 in debt. Business 101, if you know that a cameo you're about to make is going to get shown to an audience of over 300,000 wet socks, why wouldn't you put effort into that cameo and try to convert some of those viewers into customers. So you're telling me that this girl right here went to school for four years to become a history teacher, taught history in New York City for 19 years. Danielle probably assigned a lot of class presentations and homework assignments during those 19 years. <laughs> the cameo she sent us is so joked because how many times throughout her career as a teacher do you think she hit students with the 
Jared, you just didn't put in enough effort into this project. <laughs> or Jared, you know, I really don't want to give you an F, but you earned it. To make matters more troll, she hit us with that this subject isn't my history specialty. You know, my history background is actually in God of War. Because when I fought Zeus and killed him, it made me want to get into mythology. Do y'all know that Hades was the original goth boy? You see him, Poseidon, and Zeus all drew lots to see which part of the world they would rule. As you all are probably aware, Zeus got the skies, Poseidon got the oceans, and Hades got the underworld, unfortunately, which isn't the most picturesque place. You have to remember that the gods are men, very manly men, and they have needs. Hades ruled over the dead with an iron fist and cared very little about things having to do with the outside world because he didn't want anyone from his domain to escape to the world of the living. In many movies and shows, they demonize Hades because he ruled over the dead, but he was just doing his job all the while taking care of a big stinky three-headed dog named Cerberus who's a good boy. Meanwhile, you know who weren't doing their jobs? Poseidon and Zeus because they were too busy polymorphing into animals to sneak in a girl's rooms and have sex with them without their consent. Zeus was married to Hera and cheated on her with just about every single flavor of human and nymph. It's comical that Zeus was the king of the gods, yet he was the most petty. He always had a chip on his shoulder when it came to Hades and always tried to paint him in a bad light because Hades reminded him of the the discipline that he lacked. The citizens of ancient Greece didn't build many temples to Hades because you can't reason with death, it's inevitable. Back then in the average citizen's mind, it made more sense to build a temple to Poseidon and have an abundance of fish because fish is a primary food source. So my guy Hades is doing all this work. He's not getting noticed for his work because the humans aren't building temples to him and he's a homebody. So the other gods are perceiving him as a weirdo because he's not showing up to the orgies like Zeus and Poseidon. You guys get the picture. Hades is being diligent. Zeus is turning himself into a snake and constricting some princess in a tower. It's almost like Orochimaru if he got his hands on Sasuke. One day Hades is hard at work managing the dead in the underworld and he hears a loud bang. He goes up to see what the noise was and it turned out that a volcano exploded. All of a sudden Hades hears beautiful singing. She might have been ancient Greek Ariana Grande for all we know. The voice is on key. Hades walks over to see what this girl looks like and it turns out that she's an absolute smoke show. They're very different vibes if you look at this picture. He's more of a death knight. She's more of a forest elf. Opposites attract he already is very interested in her just because she has a fire voice and she's good looking. Hades was unaware of this, but nearby Aphrodite and her son were lurking in the shadows and they shot him with one of those love arrows that you would see Cupid have. So Hades gets shot by this love arrow. He is overcome with lust. He looks at this girl and her name's Persephone. He walks up to her, starts spitting game. She's a little slow with her responses because she's like, who is this stranger talking to me? He's like, you know what? Forget this. Grabs her, carries her to the underworld. He shouldn't have kidnapped her. However, it is Aphrodite and her punk kid's fault because they shot him with the love arrow and you can think about it like ancient Greek Viagra. He was fully torqued. Once Hades brings Persephone down to the underworld, he gives her a room in his palace. He's rich. It's not the most important thing, but it definitely doesn't suck. Am I right? Mind you, this god just got shot by a love arrow. He is overcome with feelings of lust and this desire to force himself on top of her, but he doesn't do so. He has enough respect for her to leave her alone and let her calm down and process what she's feeling before he engages in that conversation again. That is self-control that his brothers do not have. Time passes, Persephone is chilling out in her suite in the palace, and all of a sudden the door opens up, Hades walks in and professes his love to her and says that he wants to spend the rest of his life with her. It's worth mentioning that Hades is not bad looking at all. Contrary to how Disney portrayed him, he doesn't actually look like that. He's actually a really good looking dude. He's an intellectual, people enjoy talking to him, and he's very much an all or nothing person. Hades was described as having black hair, a muscular build, and kind eyes. This is what people think he looked like. Persephone, who is a beautiful goddess, found Hades to be very charming. However, she was still a little sussed out because the man did just kidnap her. This love between these two gods with completely different vibes is starting to blossom down in the underworld, but on the surface, Demeter, Persephone's mother, is worried sick because she can't find her daughter. While looking for her daughter on the surface, Demeter ran into one of her attendants who informed her that Hades came up out of the ground and kidnapped Persephone and brought her to the underworld. Y'all, Demeter turned into mama bear. She was pissed. You could have fried an egg on her head because she's obviously very worried about her daughter and she loves her very much. Demeter's probably the worst mother-in-law to piss off because she's the goddess of agriculture, fertility, and soil, which is important if you want to grow any food. <laughs> Demeter's distraught. She misses her daughter. She's worried about her well-being, so no food is growing, and Zeus finally gets off of his orgy or whatever he was on at the time to do something about it. So he sends Hermes with Demeter down to the underworld. Zeus sent Hermes with Demeter because he's very familiar with the routes and knows how to get to 
Hades' palace. However, dun dun dun, right when Demeter arrives, she witnesses her daughter accepting a pomegranate seed from Hades, and when she eats the pomegranate seed, she turns into the queen of the underworld. Demeter starts yelling at her daughter and asks her why she would accept fruit from such an evil man. Persephone was like, daddy chill, because Hades was actually a good dude. He treated her with respect and love and promised to spend the rest of his life loving her, not to mention in the underworld she was a queen. So Hades and Persephone are down bad for each other and mom's big sad. Hades sees how sad his mother-in-law is and it moves him so much that he makes a compromise to her. And that compromise is half the year he will allow his wife to spend her time on the surface with her mother and the other half of the year down in the underworld with him. As y'all are aware, half the year the crops are doing good, half the year not as much. This is how ancient Greeks made sense of the seasons. Contrary to how the media portrays Hades, he is a kind and loving and trusting husband that doesn't assault women or cheat on his wife, unlike his brothers. His brothers, who by the way, got a great edit and have gotten great edits in every movie they're in. But more importantly, y'all notice how even though the Cold War era is in my history specialty, I still put in effort to answer the question. Johan is no Hades, but he certainly knows what it's like to make compromises for a relationship to work. In our last video on Danielle and Johan, we talked about her extensive debt that she left behind in New York City. Danielle is a whopping over $200,000 in debt. And to make matters worse, she didn't tell her husband about her debt before marrying him. Daniel also lied to Johan about starting his visa application paperwork in the United States. In the most recent episode of 90 fiance the other way, Danielle and Johan have an explosive argument and Danielle says to the audience, he's not taking ownership of the fact that he has been dishonest. That is a very hypocritical thing to say to the audience, Danielle, when you are doing the exact same thing to your husband in a more disrespectful way. When we first see Danielle and Johan on this episode, she makes him carry her purse. So let's just add that to the compromises that this man has had to make in this relationship. The couple goes to a restaurant to have lunch with one of Danielle's friends from New York City. Same friend that they're meeting with assumes that Johan is using Danielle for her Money, and I'm just thinking to myself, bitch, where? <laughs> then this friend has the audacity to say to the audience, Danielle has been through a lot. I think she's very trusting. I wanna see if Johan is everything Danielle manifested. Here's a crazy idea. If you're struggling financially, how about instead of manifesting someone to dick you down, you manifest a financial advisor. Danielle's trusting is such a troll thing to say. Actions speak louder than words do. And from Danielle's deceitful actions, it shows that she doesn't trust her husband, Johan at all. Obviously this friend came with bad intentions and starts grilling Johan. The friend asks Johan if he wants children. He responds very much so. In fact, his entire family wants him to have children. The friend then asks a follow-up question to Johan, which is, would he be okay with him and Danielle not having a child? Danielle's 42 years old, and she already saw a doctor who told her that she only has a 5% chance of getting pregnant, so it's highly unlikely. Johan responds that he wouldn't feel good not having a child, but he has a really good gut feeling about it and truly believes that God will provide them a child. Johan doesn't exactly answer the question here, but they don't follow up with him about it. Johan is a man of faith, and praise all the time that him and Danielle can have a child together. If he knew about the debt, I don't know if he would still be praying for it though. The friend then asks Johan if he has any children that he knows about. Johan starts laughing and he responds no, but he's had a couple scares in the past. Johan says that some girls he had sex with had miscarriages and some got rid of it on purpose, implying that some of the girls had abortions. Wow, that's the first time I'm hearing that. Danielle goes on to say that Johan told her that some of the girls he was sexually active with in the past had miscarriages, but he never mentioned abortions. Danielle then says to the audience, I'm not upset about the abortion, I'm upset that Johan hasn't been honest with me. My relationship is about my faith in him and his honesty, and if I lose that, then what do we have? I'm upset that Johan hasn't been honest with me. Oh, okay. Danielle, this is what you're doing. This is what we want you to do. How about take personal accountability for your lack of transparency in your relationship? If we look back at the show Love in Paradise, she was wine and dining Johan all the time. She threw money at this man to attract him. She mentioned that she paid $4,000 in rent back home in New York City. Danielle and Johan come from completely different socioeconomic backgrounds. She knew his financial situation before entering this relationship. She knew that this was a man with great family values that dreams of moving to the United States to earn a higher wage for himself and his family. She dangled the carrot in front of his face. She made him promises that she would bring him to the United States. All of a sudden, she shows up to Dominican Republic and goes back on her word and says that she wants to live there with him. You've been dishonest to this man throughout this entire relationship. You are what you attract. So how do you not expect to attract dishonesty when you're a dishonest person? Now that I know that Johan has been dishonest about this one thing, I just have this tape running in my mind of all the things that he's told me and wondering how much of them 
are not true. Also, you know that your partner's struggling financially, so you take him to an apartment that costs $2,000 a month in Dominican Republic, which is crazy expensive. You take him there, know that he can't afford it, and try to hit him with the bill and ask how he's gonna split rent with you when his family lives in Dominican Republic and he could just stay with his family and drive to see you and hang out with you. He doesn't have to live with you. But for you to do that and try to make him feel bad about his financial situation on camera in front of the entire world, is manipulative and really fucked up. Trust is so important to me. Clearly, Danielle only thinks about herself in a relationship setting, and she's probably one of those girls that labels every single ex that she's been with as toxic. Honestly, Scott, what bothers me the most about the way that Danielle is speaking to Johan about the abortion incident throughout this entire episode is that she fails to recognize how that would make him feel. This woman, someone that claims to be intuitive, a spiritual wellness coach, a member of the Ifa tradition. However, she's just a culture vulture that is using a young rip dude in Dominican Republic for sex. If she just steps back and thinks about this logically, that's a very sad thing that a woman aborted his child. Have you ever thought about how that would make him feel? How that would make all of us feel? It's obviously a very traumatic thing for the woman, but it's also traumatic for the man. Like I can only imagine if I got a girl pregnant and I was getting excited, I was getting my finances in order, I was ready to step up and finally be a dad. I wanted to be a dad my entire life. So for that to happen, if a girl came back to me and was like, hey, I aborted the kid, I would be fucking devastated about that. Not to mention, let me know what y'all think about this in the comments, but I feel like with traumatic events like that, that have happened in the past, that's one of those things when someone tells you when they're comfortable telling you. He's not the kind of dude that's prying into her past and given her past history that's already been exposed on our channel by someone that was a former student of Danielle's, there's probably a lot of stuff there. Not to mention from what we've seen in past episodes, this girl's intentions are clearly not good. Don't get me wrong, I agree that you should have honesty in your relationship, but it's so hypocritical when you yourself aren't honest and you're demanding honesty from your partner. You did not say that they terminated the pregnancy. Those are two different things. Neither of them make me upset or angry with you. What makes me angry with you is the fact that you lied about it. Danielle takes this fact that Johan didn't tell her about the abortion and runs with it the entire episode and her intentions are so easy to read. She's obviously doing the most to paint him out as an untrustworthy person because she herself is untrustworthy. We're all adults throughout the path of life we encounter suffering. If someone that was a partner of mine opened up about a trauma that happened to them in the past, my first instinct would be to comfort them and make sure that they feel like they're safe and okay. You're a toxic human. Hey. You are a toxic human. Soy tóxico. Sí. ¿Por qué te casaste conmigo? Because this isn't who you were. Si tú no me crees, dejemos esto entonces. Let me know what y'all think about Danielle and Johan and their many issues in the comments below. If anyone disagrees with me about this particular issue, that is totally okay. Friends can disagree. I want it to be an open-ended question in our comment section. If y'all want some one-on-one -on -one time with me, please order a cameo. I'm the number one cameo creator in the entire world. Super thankful for y'all watching my content. Comment below, subscribe. Leave your man, leave your man. Follow me on Twitch and on Instagram right now.